Good evening, welcome. My name is Pi Gardner, and um, it's my great and good fortune to be director of the Merchant's House Museum. And for those of you, besides the fact that the only other person besides Spirits who's gotten this standing room only has been Edith Wharton. Um, so I welcome you all and thank you for your patience and for those of you who have to stand. Um, for those of you who've never been here before, I think you're in for a treat. Uh, the Merchant's House was built in 1832 and it is New York City's only family home that's been preserved intact inside and out from the 19th century. Uh, the Treadwell family moved in the house in 1835. Seabury, who's right there for those of you who can see, and his wife Eliza and their eight children. And they lived in the house for the next 100 years till 1933. And so we've got all their stuff. We've got their furniture, we've got their clothing, we've got their china, which leads us to why we're all gathered here tonight. If we've got all their stuff, why wouldn't they be here? Some of them, <laughs> some of us, who've been here, we've, we've heard them, we've felt them. Some of us have even, we think, smelled them cooking. I've never seen anything, and I feel very, well, it's unfortunate, I hope to one day. Um, before we get to our lecture, um, I'd like to tell you about the rest of the evening. Following the lecture, I do hope that you will take time to see, to look around the house, upstairs the floor of bedrooms, and then join us downstairs for a refreshment. Um, for our reception and the garden will be open as well. Now I'm going to turn it over to our friends at the Parapsychology <coughs> Foundation. We brought in the experts to begin to answer the question, could the Merchant's House be haunted? Uh, this is Lisette Coley, the director of the Parapsychology Foundation, and I want to thank them for uh, coming down tonight and helping us learn what might be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Pi Gardner and the Board of Trustees for the museum for allowing this evening. Normally, P Parapsychology Foundation will. Excuse me? The microphone is not working. Have I stepped on it? How's that? I'm so high tech. But in any case, uh, Parapsychology Foundation, who we represent, uh, is a nonprofit organization. We're located at 228 East 71st Street, up in uh, the Upper East Side, in our own brownstone. And uh, I would welcome you. We have an excellent Eileen J. Garrett Library. And uh, you'll find a bibliography specifically that Dr. Carlos Alvarado has prepared for you for, to continue your research into uh, the mysteries of hauntings. So again, I would welcome you to come to the foundation. And uh, at this point, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, our speaker tonight. Dr. Carlos Alvarado is a staff member of the foundation. He serves as our Chairman of Domestic and International Programs, which is one hell of a title, but it covers quite a lot of ground. He's been a past president of the Parapsychological Association, which is really the working union internationally of academics who are really uh, specifically looking into the science of parapsychology. His particular uh, expertise in, is in hauntings and also in out-of-body experiences. So since we're tight tonight, guys, I want you to all stay firmly in your seats. <laughs> we don't need anybody running to the doorways. So at this point, I'm going to turn you over into his capable hands, Dr. Carlos Alvarado. Thank you very much. The topic we're going to discuss tonight is one of those things that has captured the imagination of humankind from the beginnings. What you see here in this slide is the essence of what we call a haunted house. Basically a place where mysterious things happen, a place where ghost apparitions appear in people's bedrooms, go through houses, do all kinds of things make people very, very nervous. <laughs> the merchant house is said to be haunted. Things like what you, you see here are being reported here in this house till recent times. What we are going to attempt to do tonight is a general discussion of 
the merchant house phenomena in the context of what has been done since the 19th century to study what we call haunted houses. There is certainly a very long history of attempts to study these things, to document them. There are people who have tried to bring cameras, all kinds of equipment to these houses, and try to do something scientific to see if something is really happening. These topics are always mysterious, difficult to document. And even through, we have more than 100 years, of course, of history of research into these things, we still have a lot of questions. As you know, there are still a lot of people that do not believe that these things happen at all. Others think that they can be explained by people's you know, hallucinations, fantasies, all kinds of things that do not involve real psychic phenomena. And of course, when we talk about real psychic phenomena, something like seeing a figure like this, this person is looking out from his bed, uh, we are talking about something that we do not understand. We do not know what really is happening there. Is there a real spirit appearing there? Someone that has died that is coming back to deliver a message or just to bother that poor guy that was sleeping peacefully in his bed? Mm -hmm. Or are there other explanations? Certainly, uh, there are many cases and some cases are good, others are lousy. And in between, we have a lot of cases that are good in some aspects, not very good in others. These things depend on human testimony. Human testimony is very weak, very difficult to validate, and uh, there is always room for doubt. But having said that, I think, as we will cover in, in the lecture, there are many uh, interesting cases through the history of psychical research that I think are very difficult to explain uh, by normal explanations, you know, that people are crazy, they're hallucinating, or, or even that they're inventing phenomena. What this uh, slide shows is the popular imagination. What people think about these things is certainly very much with us even to this day. I have a, an interesting example that I found in, a, in an American newspaper in 1867. This is the Boston Post, which is writing about a haunting. And it's basically referring to the house of uh, Mrs. Surratt which was involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this person was executed together with other people, and later they were trying to sell or rent her house. And they were having all kinds of problems with the house. They put a lot of money to remodel the house. And uh, finally, when people started coming to the house, they started leaving mysteriously. And a Washington correspondent of the Boston Post wrote the following. In the course of time came a tenant, but not to remain. In less than six weeks, the lessee had flown from beneath the roof, forfeited his year's rental, and was ready to swear with chattering teeth that his nervous system was shattered for a lifetime. Excuse me, could you speak up a little louder? Others succeeded to the occupancy of the house he had vacated in turn to make a shuddering exit. Mrs. Surratt House is haunted, said the correspondent. There can be no reasonable doubt upon the subject. So here we have someone saying in the Boston Post in 1867 that haunted houses are real, they exist, and in this particular case, people are coming and leaving the house because the house is haunted. There is a ghost there that is bothering people, so a lot of them break the lease, they leave even losing their money. This is not a new phenomenon at all. Since ancient times, in the old writings about the Romans and the Greeks, we find similar cases of people coming into houses, they are renting, they are living, and uh, they want to break their leases because there is a ghost, they hear sounds during the night or the like. Again, <laughs> this documents how all these ideas have got very much into our imagination as a people and how they are very much involved in our beliefs in daily life. There are many legal cases in which leases have been broken from antiquity to recent days just because the house is supposed to be haunted. Many cases sometimes go to court, and there is a lot of controversy, but the idea is there. There are houses that have something in them, something sticking in them, inside, something coming from outside, 
We don't know how the thing works, but there is a tradition of these things in the popular imagination. And this is a particular example. Some of these phenomena, like this type of ghosts, have been reported <laughs> right here in this house. Let me tell you about a very short example that appears in this book, New York City Ghost Stories, written by Charles Adams in 1996, where he says that in the 1930s there was someone working in this, in this house, and this person saw, quote, a wispy figure dressed in Victorian clothing descending a staircase. The figure came in, the person saw it, is that's what we call a haunting apparition, which is what we have here in this slide. It's one of the main characteristics of what we call haunted houses, seeing a figure of some sort. But let me, let me go back a little and get into what do we mean when we say that a house is haunted? A haunted house in psychical research and spiritualism means that there is a particular place where unexplained phenomena happen. That's a very general and vague definition, but the main uh, aspect of the definition is that whatever happens is bound to the place. And the place can be a house, it can be a room in a house, it can be a section of a house, such as a staircase, or it can be only the basement, or only the entrance, or a particular corner. When people are in those areas, they feel strange things. And we will get a little later about what are some of these uh, strange things. But a haunting is not necessarily confined to, to the walls. There can be hauntings outside a building. There are many interesting cases of, say, haunted roads. Of, you know, you're walking on a, on a particular road and you experience all kinds of phenomena outside of the house. And a lot of people that come and walk in that road, when they get together and they compare stories, they find out that all of them saw a, a ghost, heard similar sounds, or in the most dramatic cases, you even get uh, accounts of carriages and uh, horses, all kinds of things coming through the road. So these phenomena have a long history being outside of houses as well. It's just that most of them happen inside houses. Again, they can be houses, they can be apartments, there can be gas stations. It doesn't matter wha what it is that we're talking about. The issue here is that they are localized. The phenomena that people experience are localized in a particular place. And when different people come in, they experience different things in this particular area. This doesn't mean <laughs> that anyone that comes into the place has an experience or even has the same experience. One of the things that we have found over the years in analyzing these cases is that there is always a small percent of people that are highly sensitive to these manifestations. So some people see, hear a lot of things. Others are right there with the person that is seeing something and they never see anything. Sometimes, very rarely, people together see things or hear things at the same time. And those are the most interesting uh, hunting cases. I'm going to give you some examples of cases I have investigated that have those features. But again, they, they are characterized mainly by the location. However, there are always exceptions in all these cases. Yes, as in all classifications in, in psychical research or in any other areas of science, classifications are artificial. And there are always cases where most of the phenomena happen in one place, but sometimes people seem to take the phenomena with them to other places. So if they see things here, maybe some of them will see things or hear things in other places as well. But in general, the phenomena focus on one particular location. Now we have been talking about phenomena. Let me show you basically what are we talking about. This slide basically summarizes uh, a study that Alan Gold, which is a British psychical researcher, he collected a, a lot of cases through the literature from antiquity, and here are 172 cases that he broke down in terms of the characteristics of these hauntings. What are people experiencing in these houses? Well, noises is a very common one. 92% of those 172 cases, they experience all kinds of different noises, from footsteps to poundings on walls, to if people went and, and did a sound like this, 
they heard something similar, almost like replying to it. That's what he means by imitative uh, noises. Raps are also uh, similar noises, but they sound mainly on, on wood, things like this. And again, in some cases, they can be intelligent. Phantasms are apparitions, ghosts, like the first slide that I showed you. You can see 52%. Voices, objects, large or small objects moving. From here up are the more common phenomena. The lower ones are phenomena that also they happen, they're less common. And examples are smells, in this case, offensive smells. But there are other instances where the smells are really nice, <laughs> perfumes and, and the like. Water phenomena, the water appears and no one can explain from what it appears. They see a wall and there is water coming through and they check the wall for the plumbing and there is no obvious explanation of where this water is coming from. That type of thing. Misty figures, which is different from the phantasms here. Phantasms represents visual, very clear apparitions. While misty figures are just like a, a ball of mist or a strange human-like shape made of mist that may appear or move around, but no one can recognize or see any, any particular feature. And the last one here is damage on, on plants, sometimes also damage on objects and the like. This is only an example of, of some of the, of the phenomena that, that have been reported. Another slide from the same, uh, the same study is a more particular Example of specific cases. This case from Germany, these are the main phenomena. Raps, noises, voices, or apparitions. In the other one in Milan, in 1464, we have only basically two things. The raps, which are these noises, sometimes on walls, and hands that are seen. These embodied hands that people say that they saw in different places in the house. As you can see, the, these ones have just a few phenomena compared to these that have a lot of other things happening. That's also characteristics, characteristic of hauntings. That some cases are extremely complex and you have movement of objects, voices, apparitions, uh, all kinds of things that you can see here are others just wraps and hands. So they are from the very complex with a lot of things happening at the same time to the very simple where they see only one thing or everyone hears only the same sound. There is a lot of variety in, in the phenomena. More recently here, we have this very interesting <coughs> case where misty figures, again, were seen, which is a very interesting feature in these cases. But the point I want to make is the variety of phenomena. Not all hunting cases are, are, uh, are the same. You know, people sometimes think that in all these cases, there is a ghost that comes through or that there is the same type of noise, and that's really not true. Cases vary in complexity and type of phenomena, and that's something important uh, to keep in mind. One particular case that I want to summarize to you is that which is uh, generally called the Cheltenham Hunting, which is an example of a case that was focused on one phenomenon, and that is the phenomenon of apparition and this is what this, you know, this haunting case consisted of. People were seeing this figure appearing. Cheltenham is a place in England that are, are on a, from between 1882 and about 1892. A family living there had remarkable experiences seeing what you're seeing here. Uh, the main witness here is a young woman that at that time was 19 years old. She was a medical student in England, and at that time, not many women were studying medicine. She later qualified and led a, a good medical, a successful medical practice. Uh, she had a scientific mind and was a very talented individual. Not only that, which is unusual for women in the, on those days to have the opportunity to study medicine and to have a family that will support her, her, her studies, but she also had a, she was very courageous. What she basically did was Every time she saw this in the place where she lived, she went after the ghost and tried to do something with the ghost in order to document the existence of this figure. The first time she sees this figure is she's in her room and she hears strange sounds outside of her room. She goes out with her candle and she sees this, you know, woman with a handkerchief to her face, a long uh, black dress, 
And uh, she start, starts to go after her because she realizes she doesn't belong in the house. It's something very strange. But uh, her candle blows up, and she has to go back to the room and start thinking, you know, what was that? During the next year, she has remarkable opportunities to see uh, these goals. One of them happened in January of 1884, and this is something, a, a letter that she wrote to a friend. And she said, I opened the drawing room door softly and went in, standing just by it, just by the apparition, the ghost. She came in past me and walked to the sofa and stood still there. So I went up to her and asked her if I could help her. She moved and I thought she was going to speak, but she only gave a slight gasp and moved towards the door. Just by the door, I spoke to her again, but she seemed as if she were quite unable to speak. She walked into the hall, then by the side door, she seemed to disappear. So this is one of the earliest attempts that she has of doing something with this figure. She sees the figure really frequently in her house. Other people, like her father, can never see the figure. But she has two other sisters that see the figure all the time. A brother has saw it at least once, and several housemates that are claiming that they are seeing it all the time in different rooms and all around the house. But it's very interesting that there are times where she is with her father and she can see it, and the father just walks through it and he cannot see anything, which is something also very typical of these cases. But what is interesting is that several times, more than one person at the same time are able to see uh, this figure. She makes the point that she has seen this figure disappear suddenly on many occasions, that the figure makes noises, such as footsteps, and she tries to do several things to study it. One of them, she follows her all around. She tries to corner this ghost, he tries to touch the ghost, and when she thinks he's about to touch it, the thing always disappears. Or when she kind of approaches the figure, the figure always eludes her in a way that sometimes she's not sure even how. It kind of moves very fast, and she can never really keep up with her, so she can never touch her. She, she put an easel with a camera to take pictures, because someone told her you should have uh, objective evidence. And she tries to do this, but the cameras in those days required too much time for exposure, so she's never able to take a picture. She tried to engage in conversations, and one of the most interesting things that she does is that she puts strings at the bottom of the stairs, because on the stairs is the part where the apparition regularly comes and goes. And what she wants to see is if this ghost is a material figure and will break the, the threads that she puts there, or if she it will go through the threads without disturbing them. And she says that on at least two occasions, she, she clearly saw how the ghost went through the threads and the threads never moved and they were intact. And she had them fixed to the stairs with pellets of glue. And uh, she, she basically says this is evidence that although I'm seeing this thing, this thing has no material substance. But imagine how interesting is this young woman there going after this ghost, no matter where the thing appears, there she goes with her threads, with her camera, always trying to touch it. Uh, it's something that even psychical researchers today, I, I can see a lot of people in the field doing research that if they were face to face with something like this, they would be the first ones to run out of the house. <laughs> it's, it's something not easy to deal with these things, you know. One thing is to read these things and think about it. One other thing is to be in a house that is dark and uh, you see that thing coming at you. This woman was kind of remarkable, and because of her, her characteristics you know, and her scientific training, she produced a document that was published in 1892 in the Proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research that to this day remains a unique document. There is really no other uh, ghost story as impressive as, as this case. But this is a case that shows how one phenomena is a uh, characteristic of of hauntings. Another case that supposedly still is active is a case in Spain where faces like this appear on walls and floors. Belmez, Spain is a very small village and this uh, case has become so controversial that politicians and religious figures, you know, like priests and bishops, and they all go there to give an opinion and to see this, this phenomena. And it has become so controversial that to this point we don't know really what's true or what is false because it has really become kind of a field day. 
It's a type of thing that goes really out of control and you would like to investigate carefully, but when it gets involved in the media and in, in people's imagination in a way that the, uh, a good investigation now is really not possible. Everyone is accusing everyone else of fraud or going there during the night and painting the faces. And in now it's very difficult to know what happened. But it's a case that is usually cited, especially in the European literature, as a hunting, you know, a place where in a particular place things happen, but only one phenomena happens. These, appear, these faces that appear on the wall. Again, the, the variety of things that happen are, are, really, are really wide. And cases with one thing and cases with many other phenomena. It's a, it's a very mysterious, very difficult to deal thing. But all these things occur in a much wider context. As, as Pai Gardner was telling you, this house was built in 1832. Very soon after, about 1848, in the United States happens what we call the birth of modern spiritualism. The Fox Sisters in 1848 start being very active. Those were a, a Fox family that have some young girls that claim that a spirit came through them and could communicate making noises. They started asking, are you alive? And they say, one, one sound for yes, two for no. And from that very simple moment grew the movement of spiritualism, which was connected with a lot of other developments that were happening in the United States even before. Uh, the development of hypnosis, the development of so many spiritual movements occurred from around the time where this house was built to the beginning of the 20th century. Psychical research, or the beginnings of modern parapsychology, developed also in, the, in, in that particular period, well, a little later in the 1880s, where people are starting to look at this type of phenomena, are trying to find out what is happening in houses such as the, as the merchant house. But <coughs> what we find in all these uh, interesting uh, Interesting movement is that each of them brings a particular explanation. Spiritualism brings the idea that there are spirits that are watching us and that are telling us what to do. They can communicate with us. They can manipulate the environment, such as what is reported to occur in haunted houses. Spirits are, it, they, it says that they are in a house. They move objects. They play the piano. They are, are to be accounted for all kinds of manifestations. That's what modern spiritualism tells us. Again, there, may, there are other explanations. There are many other views of seeing the phenomena. But spiritualism brings us this particular view that what we are seeing <coughs> are the, the spirits of deceased individuals. The Nice Out of Nature is a book that is published in 1848 by Catherine Crow, which was uh, well known in England for her literary work. And here she brings a lot of different, excuse me, accounts of phenomena, including haunted houses, which again give us a lot of similar phenomena to what we find today here in the merchant house. Now let's see, what are the phenomena that have been reported in the merchant house? A lot of the things that we have heard about are very similar to what I have been discussing from the old days of spiritualism, the old days of psychical research. For example, going back to Charles Adams' book, The New York City Ghost Stories, he said, with very little detail, but he mentions uh, a lot of people saying that they heard the piano being played by itself. Objects seem to be misplaced. That people had an object in one place, and later on they couldn't find it. That was reported here. They heard giggling sounds. They perceived the smell of fresh flowers in different parts of the house. And they saw more apparitions of ghosts, you know, figures that are maybe similar, perhaps not as frightening as that. This one it got a little sensational because they wanted to sell the book. But they talk about a ghostly woman in a long dress that was seen in the kitchen of the house and later in other parts of the house. That's what this book tells
refers to the movement of our Lord. Someone that was here in the museum was uh, showing the house to his father that was visiting. And then he, he writes, As we approached the family dining room, the door was slowly opening by itself. I looked behind the door, and no one was there. This is a person that is very used to be here, and he knows very well if there are normal movements of the door or not, and he assures me that this door, he has never seen it you know, move, move it like that. And he believes there is something unusual about it. Two persons see the thing and the thing. This type of phenomena happen frequently. Although sometimes you cannot be sure, you know, when it's a door, uh, some people ask for more impressive movement of objects, more impressive phenomena. But haunted houses tend to have a lot of this slow scale phenomena happening all around. And what is more impressive is not one incident, but when you get together a lot of different incidents of that type. Which is what the staff here can tell you. There are many, many of these stories happening to a lot of different people. Another one in November of 2000, this refers to Santos. This person says, I was working late one night, one night in my office here. I went to the supply closet for a folder, and when I came out, I was paralyzed. Paralyzed with fear because I heard what sounded like the footsteps of two to three children running on the floor below me. There were no voices or other sounds, just the clumsy sound of small children running. It lasted for about four to five seconds and then back. Again, this is another phenomenon that has been reported over and over time. Footsteps. In the Cheltenham ghost, if you remember, it was said that the ghost will make noises walking around a corridor or rubbing against the doors of the corridor. The mysterious sounds are reported frequently. And sometimes uh, some of these, these sounds are really loud. This is another example of something that happened here. These are sounds coming downstairs was reported uh, in December of 2000 for this story is very really recent. This person was, uh, there was uh, an event happening here in the, in the house, and this person was sitting at the base of the staircase just out there. And she writes, I heard someone come down the steps from the children's bedroom floor. The stairs in the house make a very distinct creaking noise. And I actually got up to let whoever was going down the steps pass me. As the staircase is very narrow, as the staircase is very narrow, when nobody came down, I just assumed that they had stopped on the bedroom floor to see the rooms that were open. But later on, they went on and checked, and they couldn't find anyone. And we're very much surprised, because sitting at the base and hearing someone coming through, not seeing anyone, not finding anyone on the upper room, they couldn't figure out really who I was out. Again, this is a very typical phenomenon of haunted houses. Feelings that something, someone is coming and making noises, either on the stairs, on the walls, or something like that. And there are many other experiences that have been reported here. Equipment failure is an interesting one. Basically, failure of things like staple machines, the phones, and all kinds of, of other things. Uh, these are the type of phenomena that you have to look into the more recent cases because a lot of the old cases, like these ones I have been discussing here, since there was less technological development, there are less things you know, that you can find out that are missing down. But in the modern literature, as well as in the immersion house here, you tend to find an occasion how people will tell you that they have a camera and that camera did not work well in the house. Or tape recorders that, that were working fine said that when you were using it in that house and you came to investigate or to see it, the whole thing jammed and sometimes ate the tape or something happened. This doesn't happen all the time. It's not that you get it in 90% of the time, but it happens here and there and it's in enough, of enough frequency that it puzzles you and makes you think, well, if all these other phenomena are happening, perhaps something is also affecting the equipment. But again, it happens in a way that you're never sure about this it's very difficult to, to explain. But it leaves you with a feeling that something is going on. Then there are issues such as pictures. I believe that there are some pictures that have been taken you know, over here that when you see the picture, show very strange and luminous effects, you know, just like a streak of light 
example, like a column of smoke in the middle of the picture. Uh, that again happens in many of these cases, where people said are taking pictures and they find strange globes of light in the corners of the room, or other mysterious photographic effects that again, you never have get a complete, a clear explanation of what's happening. There's always a possibility that the camera malfunction, that something happened with the, with the film itself. In many of these cases, you never know. And I'm sure there are many other phenomena that happen here in the merchant house. I really have not been able to collect all the testimony of people that have passed through the house and say that they have heard, seen, or smelled things. But I'm sure there must be a lot more. One thing that would be interesting to do would be to collect all that testimony to try to evaluate it in a more systematic way. To answer the question if the merchant house is haunted, these questions you can never answer like that with a yes or no, especially when no specific scientific investigation has been conducted here in the house. But certainly, we have enough evidence that a lot of unexplained phenomena have happened to people that were here and that have come through here. We have enough of that evidence to say that things happen in this house with a, a high frequency and that the things are localized in the house, which is one of the criteria to say that a place is haunted. Even if, remember, when we say that a place is haunted, we don't know what, what is the meaning of that. Are we talking that there are spirits of people that have died? Are we talking that there are strange energies that we don't know? Are we talking that some people have a tendency to hallucinate in specific places? <laughs> Probably there are cases that some of those explanations apply and others do not. So then when a lot of people see a ghost at the same time, that's much harder to explain by normal explanations. But it's only by collecting all the testimony and analyzing it that you can start having a little more certitude about possible explanations. Although in these type of cases, you are never sure of anything. You only know that experiences have happened in a place and the explanation is a whole different matter, which is the, the case here. Also, we have here that the phenomena go over a period of time. That's also very typical of haunting. There are cases that are short, a few days, but it's typical of these cases, especially in the old literature, that they go over time, sometimes over many years, and you have uh, generations living in the family, and they will, those good cases with their diaries, again from the old days, you will find entries basically saying, well, for 20 years, nothing seemed to have happened, and this morning we heard those noises again, just like my mother used to talk about you know, that type of thing. So a lot of these things go over long periods, and in here at the Merchant House, we have a, a history a long period when it was stationed. The phenomena are also very typical of what is reported in the classic haunted cases. Ghosts are seen, a variety of sounds are experiences, even smells have been reported. All that can be found in charts like the one I presented to you with the cases from England collected by Alan Gold. These things that happen here are very similar to what has been reported from other parts of the United States, from Europe, and from many other countries. So all those things are very consistent uh, with typical cases of homelessness. Still, this place needs uh, more investigation in order to find out uh, more details about the cases. Like the ghost that has been seen, uh, can we really be sure that we know if this ghost represents a particular person or not? Uh, in my reading of, uh, and listening to some of the testimony, it seems to me that we need to get more information to be sure if, if this if ghost will be sent someone that lived here, and some people believe that it's uh, one of the daughters of the, of, the, of the family that settled here, uh, named Gertrude. If we believe that that's the case, we need to do more specific investigations about if the description of the figure corresponds to what we know about Gertrude and the like continued investigation to get more details. That's, that's what we need to do at this point. And then, of course, continue assessing the evidence and getting more details, better testimony, and uh, finally try to evaluate conventional explanations. Every haunted house probably is a mixture of things that are completely unexplained and things that are completely normal. 
Like there, there are probably a lot of sounds or things that happen here that are completely normal and sometimes people might mistake them for something paranormal or spiritual. They are not saying that those things are not happening, I'm just saying that we need to study all the phenomena together and try to analyze each of the reports to try to see if we find differences between things that can be explained away and others that are still un unexplained. But that's basically what investigating a hunting is all about. You try to document the case, you try to find out first if the phenomena require an explanation or explanation other than what science has to offer. And after that, then we try to see if we can explain it in any particular way. Psychical research to this day cannot explain hunting. It's very easy to say, oh, these are spirits, these are energies. But a lot of these concepts are very ethereal, are very non-systematic. We really don't know what is really happening. Even though we have to respect people's impressions, a lot of people in this house, and in many of these cases, will tell you that from their experience, they believe they are dealing with spiritual entities. Some of them claim they have even communicated. Again, that's part of the phenomenon. That's one of the most fascinating things that haunted houses have to offer. But from the scientific point of view, it's very hard to make a determination because there are always different possibilities. The question is not to deny, not to say that nothing is happening. I certainly believe a lot is happening in this house right here. There is enough to warrant further investigation, and I think there is enough to sustain the belief that the house is haunted. That's different from saying that we have established that it's haunted scientifically, but the experiences reported here are very impressive. <coughs> And I hope that they will be studying more in the future. But in any case, even if no investigations are done, if we don't understand what's happening here, these phenomena are part of the history and tradition of this house. And that's what these phenomena mean to, to a lot of human beings. Even if we don't have specific explanations, if we don't understand what these things are happening, they are part of our history, of our society. They interact with a lot of our beliefs, a lot of our daily lives. And as such, they are important to us and need to be studied and respected. And I think it's very nice to have places in New York City, in modern New York, that still keep these ideas open and uh, presenting us as a charming place where we can discuss all these possibilities. This concludes the lecture. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank okay. you. Uh, one second. formal investigation you know for this lecture but basically it's, for me it's a question of time and resources you know this investigation we need really to bring people that do this uh, more full time and are prepared really to bring a team of researchers to investigate this type of phenomenon you need to do team investigation and to bring people that will deal with the testimony recording the testimony a lot of the measurements Modern hunting investigations uses a lot of, of instrumentation. So we to bring different technicians that can go to the house and measure. And I don't know, that would be more up to, to the merchant house and museum. I think they were interested in doing that. And I believe they have started their own uh, investigation because this is what I can speak to. Can you tell us the findings of any haunting? that has been investigated scientifically as you define scientifically? Well, there, there have been many, certainly, that have been investigated like that. One, see, I have a slide here. From the old days, and I focus more on the old days because they asked me you know, to, to focus more on the 19th century in the, in the, in the lecture. This is an example of such an investigation conducted at the end of the 19th century. This was a house, or banking house, in England, where these people basically rented the house, they moved in the house, and they published this book, the whole book, which is a diary of incidents. And they very carefully recorded every time someone saw a ghost or, or heard something, and uh, it's a very impressive uh, case. Just as the case of the Morton ghost, the, Shelter and hunting with the lady with the handkerchief. Those are two examples of good investigations where things were carefully recorded, people were cross-examined, and on, on many occasions we have the testimony of people saying, 
if something goes at the same time, or when you were in the living room and the ghost went outside, I was outside and I saw it coming from the other side. There is all kinds of information showing that there is what we call collective perceiving. So the, some of these cases are very well documented. These are cases from the older. The, moving on in time, there are other cases that have used techniques such as this. These are this is another approach in the study of haunted houses. And what you do is you bring into the house someone that has psychic ability. In this case, this is a medium. This is Eileen Garrett, which was the founder of the Parasitology Foundation. And uh, she did all this from the 1920s to the late 1930s, or even after. She was going to uh, haunted houses, and she would go to the place, and she would fall in trance. And she had great psychic abilities that are documented in many other studies. And what she tried to do was to see what she could feel about the environment of the house. And in some particular cases, she, she did what some people now call channeling, which was basically you know, bring spirits that were said to be in those places. And she gave information saying this person felt that they were despair, completely depressed, and they needed to, to do something, they committed suicide in the house. Whatever happened, she described, and, and then they, what the investigator tries to do is try to verify what she's saying. Because one thing is to say that, and another thing is what, she, if what she's saying is true. So in cases with her, and she was very accurate, they will verify all of the things and find out that what she was saying was true and that a person had been there that had similar characteristics to what she had described. In other cases, what people try to do is to exercise the house. And again, she also works out on that. And that means that you are there, you say you communicate with some spirits, you try to convince those spirits to leave. And in spiritualism from the 19th century, even before, there are all these procedures of, basically it's like a, a psychotherapy type context in which the medium talks with the spirit and tries to convince the spirits by conversation, by logic, that they're dead, they're in a house, and what are they doing there uh, frightening people? And the whole idea is that if you do that long enough, you can convince those spirits and the spirits will go away. Uh, that sometimes is very, very hard to do. There are cases from the 19th century of, of people that had circles that were mediumistic circles that were devoted just to them. I found a very interesting case in 1877, in one of the spiritualist magazines, we have at the Foundation Library, which there was a group that was going around different places in England, even getting in the basements, trying to find spirits that were confined there. And they sent mediums, and mediums said they felt a bad atmosphere. They claimed that they were able to bring the spirit to their houses later, to hold seances. And when they communicated with these entities, they were confused, they didn't know what they were doing. That's a classic spiritualist view of haunting. So what these videos try to do is try to convince people basically to live. That's another way of investigation that sometimes brings peace in the house. Sometimes after some of these procedures, nothing else happens. At least for a while, sometimes never again. But again, it doesn't work all the time. Is it your opinion that spirits are always unhappy? They have finished business. That's my question. The second part is, do they intend for us living to hear and understand? I know it's just well, your opinion. Yeah, for, for the first part, I, I don't know of any case where the spirit has claimed you know, that, they are, that they're happy. Or, you know, those that we see, you remember the old talker on TV. They were, you know, very, very happy ghosts and they kept the big, the big hats and they were dancing and doing all kinds of things. I have never heard of, you know, in this literature of, of anything like that. You know, there's always a, a negative you know, thing, depression. There's a lot of suffering in which the spirit claims that they are not aware that it, you know, there's a lot of it. Uh, what was the other part of it? Do you think they intend for us to perceive? Oh, I think each case has to be analyzed. Uh, there are some cases that seem to show that they're not even aware of people around them. You know, a, a lot of the haunting ghosts basically walk through and they never look at them. 
even if you call them or even if you are there trying to do something, they would never look at you, they would never acknowledge you. There are then others, excuse me, like the Cheltenham and Ghost, the lady with the handkerchief, that also she never spoke. She she looked at this young woman and, and gasped or tried to it, it showed that she was kind of aware and, and she was saying that on some occasions she felt that she wanted to have a wanted to be seen. There are cases where people who want to give a message to and they and they tell you I die in this way or it varies for different cases. Yes. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I just have one I don't want to discredit um, parapsychology because I'm very open to it. But yet you said that someone here heard children running on the floor below. Would that really be possible in a house with, you know, built so solidly the very last ceilings? I mean, I'm in an apartment building. I never hear people walking below me. Certainly my building is not together as well as this one. I don't know, I cannot speak about you know the, the makings of the house. I, I assume that happened late at night. And sometimes you know at night you can see things uh, crossing over. The thing is also in a lot of these the sounds in a lot of these haunting phenomena, sometimes they appear that they are normal acoustics. But many times that they're really not. I mean, they are on record many cases of people hearing, say in the attic, they have uh, all kinds of things, bags and all, and then they, they hear like someone is destroying and moving everything around. They go up there, nothing has moved, nothing has happened. And that's why some people say that the, the, the auditory components or the sound aspect of haunting are not necessarily always true sounds in which, you know, something is making an impact on the floor or on the wall or are produced in some other different way. That would be an alternate explanation to something like that, but I certainly do not Yes, can you explain the phenomena of food odors? Odors? No. No, I explain no, I cannot explain any of these phenomena. <laughs> but uh, I, I can I can tell you that although they're they are typically reported, they are not uh, so frequent. Sometimes we're talking about food odors, but a lot of the other times where we were there are flowers, our perches. Those seem to be more frequent. I see. And in some cases, some people claim that there are signs of presence. Like yes. if, if, the, if the smell was characteristic of someone in the house, like light up or the perfume or yes. something like that, you know, they believe that that expresses the intention of something. Or that's, that's as far you know, as I can say. But actually, how the smell is produced, we again come to the same point I was trying to make with her. We don't know if there is a real perfume yes. floating there that we can smell normally, or if that impression is is flowing to our brain or our perceptual system in a different way. Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine has a ghost in her that's been haunting her family, and she doesn't she doesn't want to get rid of her wants to know what to, how to deal with him. She's seen him, she, he's, uh, he's talked to James Michelle, her, her whole family yeah. has felt him, but they don't know what to do. They don't know what they should do. Yeah. Well, there are, there are many of these cases where the things that happen, people can live with them. Some people don't feel threatened at all. They feel even comfortable. They even joke about their personal goals that lives in the back room, you know, things like that. Other cases are the opposite. Other cases, people live in great fear and they need either to clean the house in some way or they have to get out themselves. Because if not, they can... Again, that, that varies. I think there are different types of cases, different intensities, different... And, um, People react just in different ways, you know. If you are going to have something like that in your house, it's better if you have something more pleasant that you can live with it. And then, over the years, you know, you can maybe start understanding what's happening by your interactions with it. Have you, have you ever seen an apparition yourself? No, not on a waking you know, state. I've never seen an apparition. I have been uh, to cases but I have interviewed people that have seen amazing things. Some of them similar to what we have uh, exposed here. But a lot of these cases are, are difficult to find. And, uh, one of the problems is also a lot of people don't want to talk about 
a lot of people are afraid, you know, uh, like uh, there are places where property loses value, they think, you think know, there is a ghost. You know, you know, some people cannot sell the house, or people get reputations of being crazy or whatever. So it's, it's sometimes it's very hard to, to find these cases. But I'm convinced you know, these cases are all around. Just, just as we are seeing here, all these things happening, and as we have seen in history, these things are happening around to a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of your neighbors right now are having this type of phenomena and a lot of other psychic experiences. But all, the, all psychic experiences also, they are not rare in any way. The society seems to have a way of covering them. Even though they are part of society and they interact with our beliefs in many important ways, there is another layer in which people are so afraid of them they just cannot cope with them, that you have to be on, on the side. I mean, you all know growing up that, that one of the things that we get in our education is ghost stories. That's, that's nonsense. You know. we, we cannot believe in that. I remember in my own education, you know, before I started reading the, into parapsychology in my early teens, the idea and the, that I got from my education is that all this stuff we have been talking about is, is that's fiction and nothing more. And just to think there is more to it is, is something really stupid and ridiculous. But that's the way society deals with it. And it's only in places like this where people are more open, that we can talk about these things, and we can bring cases that are happening. But that's up for <coughs> One more question, and they tell me that we should be stopping. Yeah, back here. You mentioned you didn't see any apparitions in your waking state. What about in, in your dream state? Have you come across any apparitions or research where um, spirits have communicated and given very specific messages to individuals, but in the dream state? Not just that, you know, um, I love you or you're here, yeah. but very specific messages. Not in my research, but I know other people have found cases like that in which the, in the context of a hundred house, they have dreams with information that later they can verify. And that seems to be a way. We know that dreams in general are a way to convey what we call ESP information, extrasensory perception. You know, people that have experiences of telepathy, clairvoyance, or precognition, experiences of seeing the future. A lot of these experiences are extremely frequent during the dreams. So you have a dream of something that will come out later being true, a prediction of the future. Dreams seem to be more efficient in bringing some of these impressions, especially about the future, than experiences in the waking state. There are also many, many experiences about dreaming about the dead. And they happen in many different circumstances. We talk about haunted houses, but there are also a lot of people that after they have lost a, a relative, a husband or a wife, or a son or a daughter, they uh, have a, a lot of these type of dreams. Of course, we have to make a distinction uh, because there are certain types of cases that you have the dreams as a form of compensation of having lost someone that you really love. But the idea here is that if you think there is something psychic, something parapsychological, you examine the content of the dream and find out if that dream is telling you information that you didn't know, like where to find that. There are cases in which people have left wills, you know, wills of, of the money that they leave to the family and all that. And one will says that they will leave all the money to only one son. And everyone else, does, they don't get anything. And uh, there are cases with through dreams, they have been able to find a missing will that basically gives the, you know, the pro explicit property 50-50. And uh, they say that in those dreams, a ghost or a figure of the person dying has come and given the information. So certainly, you know, those things happen. It's just that I have not uh, investigated or one more, and then we have to stop. One more? Did you report that the apparition is in color or in black and white? Is there any percentage there? That type of stuff is very rarely discussed, but I would say that in color is the most frequent. I cannot remember now if I've ever seen an account of an apparition in black and white. I know there have been many in color. If that would be an interesting thing to do. Really well, I think I would uh, welcome you all to sign up for the Foundation's Perspective series of lectures because obviously there are a lot of questions being raised here, of course about the museum, but certainly through the Aegeus of Parapsychology Foundation, we would welcome you to our own lecture series. 
So there will be a piece of paper outside, and if you'd like to sign up for more information. And in the meanwhile, on behalf of the museum and Parapsychology Foundation, please view the museum, and there are refreshments downstairs in the kitchen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hi there. I hope you enjoyed today's selection. My name is Lisa Coley and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I hope you give us a like and if you have a comment then do so below and we'll try and better serve you. Any suggestions are welcome. And we want to thank very much our loyal subscribers. This is a relatively new channel and a new venture for Parapsychology Foundation, so we very much appreciate uh, your loyalty. And if you haven't decided to subscribe, maybe pretty please you could. 